Welcome to the BroadArt Tell Me More Thriller webinar. We're so excited today. We have three wonderful authors, two are a New York Times bestseller or <laughs> the New York Times bestseller list, and Susie Holly will be our moderator. Susie has been a school media specialist. Um, she a, was a professor of children's literature. She also wrote the book that she used uh, while teaching the class. She's a Newberry Committee member and co-author, as I said, of children's literature. And through all this time, Susie has also been a collection development librarian for Brodart. Susie, over to you. Thank you, Elanita. We have some very special guests today. We'll start with Natalie Richards who is a New York Times bestselling author of thrillers for young people. She is an Ohioan, still lives there with her family. When she was in the second grade, she did her first writing and she wrote about Francis Bizzle Fisher. I'm still wondering if that was a real person or not. Anyway, she then got kind of caught up in business documents and discovered that she liked to make up things much more. So since then she's been doing that and we've been the recipient of nine of her novels. Go ahead, please, Natalie. Tell us about your book. Hi, everyone. I am so excited to be here today. And I apologize in advance if I'm a little rusty. I just stepped off a plane, so I am quite tired. <laughs> but I am excited to talk to you about this book. Four Found Dead is coming out very soon. Um, I'm super excited to bring this book into the world because this book was inspired by something I ride past almost every day. Um, on the way home off the freeway, there's an abandoned shopping mall on my route home from work. And every time I pass this complex, I've thought for years, like, this is the creepiest place I've ever seen. And I've been waiting for a story to come to me that's set in that mall. And finally, it did. So this is the story about six coworkers who are working late one night, the final night of the theater, which is the last remaining business in a dying shopping mall. When their shift is over, the doors lock, the lights go out, and one of them finds a dead body of one of their coworkers. They're very quickly trapped inside an abandoned shopping mall uh, kind of running for their lives. They know exactly who's after them and they're losing people one by one. So this is that book. I'm super excited about it. It was incredibly creepy to write. Um, maybe one of the most atmospheric books I ever dealt with and maybe a place that really scares me. I can't think of anything scarier than a mall. So an abandoned mall that is. So yeah, I'm really excited about it. It was a lot of fun. Well, I'll tell you, it's a pulse pounding thriller, as somebody said about your books. And as I told Jared and Sophia yesterday, these two authors and their books that we're looking at today, both books kept me up until the wee hours of the morning because I have this sickness. If I like what I'm reading, I can't put it down until I finish it. It's horrible. Anyway, so I guess maybe I, I shouldn't read any of your things anymore, right, guys? <laughs> That's our job is to keep you up late. I think oh, yeah. yeah. you have a sickness too. Yeah, yes. I <laughs> well, I, I read someplace that you actually write by the seat of your pants. You really don't know your characters. You don't know what's going to happen to them. You don't even know if they're going to come out okay at the end. It's so true. And honestly, it's a little difficult because each book I write, you know, people think by now, this is my ninth book. Surely I know what I'm doing. I do not. Every book teaches me a new way to write a book. That's what I believe I'm learning. Um, and every book at some point, I hit a place where I really don't know if I can finish it. And that happened with this book. Absolutely. There's, there's a, some point, whether it be halfway, three fourths of the way where I call my writing partner, I have a critique partner who's amazing. And I'm like, Jody, I can't do it. This is the one I'm going to have to walk away. I can't write anymore. And then I always figure it out. So it is very scary because you're launching into the darkness. But it's also important for me because if I know exactly what's happening, just the way my writer brain works, it's no longer suspenseful. I'm not afraid. So it's more difficult for me to convey that suspense and tension on the page the way I can with books that I, I don't necessarily know what's happening. Um, so some pieces I usually do know, to be fair, but always there are pieces that take me by surprise. And, and that's what I'm writing for, too, is to find those answers. Well, I also saw in your acknowledgments that you thanked your editors for helping you find out who Joe, who's the protagonist in this story, 
who she really was. Yes. Now, how in the world did that happen? I think when you write in first person, a really, uh, this is a thriller that kind of from get go, terrible things are happening to this person. Right. So there is so much involved in her survival in this story that who she is as a person outside of that can get a little muddy. I knew things, I could sense things in her past. I knew certain pieces, but the string that tied everything together, her full personality, that's something that often comes out in editing where you go, oh, I didn't realize my character had this fear or this ambition. Um, now, some people who are planners, they outline these things and they learn those answers before they begin to write the book. For me, I learned those answers in editing. Um, and in this book in particular, uh, my editor, my primary editor on the book just really cut through everything and helped me find her voice so clearly. They were able to say, this, you've got it. This is off. This is right. In a way that was incredibly helpful. Editing is such a powerful part of writing. And I think some people forget that. They think we just sit down and write the book and that's what's on the shelf. But our editors play such an important role in bringing these things to life. I agree with that. I have to ask you how you determined that you wanted to write for young adults. And I think you do have, do you have one for younger children coming out soon? I do. Well? Yes. Yes. I have um, 15 Secrets to Survival comes out with Penguin Random House, Delacorte. Uh, that comes out in the fall. I don't know if we have a firm date yet, but it's fall of this year. I'm super, super excited about that. That's a little more humorous hijinks, but definitely still thrilling, more of an adventure. Um, and writing for young people, when people ask me this, of course, I get this a lot. And I always think, why wouldn't everyone write for young people? Like, this is the most amazing time in a person's life. Between the ages of nine to 17, we're figuring out who we are for the first time. Everything is new and exciting and kind of terrifying. So it, it's an incredible audience to write for. It's an incredible voice to have in my head. I love it. I feel so privileged to write for young people. So that's why. But I, to be fair, in, in my young adult novels, I really have arguably as many adult readers now as I do younger readers, which is great too. It just speaks to how wonderful young adult fiction is. I agree with that. In fact, I was raving about both of your books to friends and to my family. And I said, if you want to read really good stories, you need to read these books. And I find that every time I go back to read young adult or children, even children's chapter books, you know, it's just, I. but I'll tell you one of the things I think, I think it's because there's always hope at the end of young adult and children's books. And I think maybe that's why I'm so drawn to them. That, I like that. That's great because I think about, I write pretty bleak books in some ways, but you're right. There is always a thread of hope. There's still a future. There's still more out there. Um, and I think that's a lot of what youth is. And I think you might be right. That's great. I love that. Oh, well, good. I like that. <laughs> Natalie, this has been wonderful. And now I think we're going to turn to Jared and Sophie, who also have a very wonderful book. And I want to say something because both of you have movie theaters in malls that are really, I couldn't believe it when I read both of those books. And they're movie theaters and malls that are going defunct. Yeah. <laughs> Please well, tell us about, now, Sophie is from Spain originally, and she came to Los Angeles, went to school there at UCLA, got her fine arts master's degree. She is a screenwriter, and uh, she and Jared met, and we haven't said this before, but they fell in love and got married, and that's a good story. And <laughs> Jared is a, um, a writer. He actually grew up with his father, Neil Schusterman, who all of us re read young adult literature know about. And so he was being mentored from a young age. I was actually thinking about it this morning and wondering if that was really where you were going to on your own the whole time, or if somehow in families you have a proclivity to do certain things. But Jared and Sophie got together and they do screenwriting. And Jared, with the book he co-authored with, authored with his father called Dry, he's doing the screen. Are you both doing it? Yeah, we're doing the screenplay. Okay, you're doing the screenplay for that. And now um, they have written together the wonderful book called Retro. And please tell us about that. Well, we're so excited to talk to you about Retro. Um, okay, so 
this book, let's give you a short pitch. Um, so <laughs> Retro is about what would happen if there was a really bad cyber bullying incident that happened at a high school and a girl was really badly bullied um, on a platform kind of like TikTok. In our book, we call them Limbo. So imagine if Limbo comes to the high school and goes, okay, we're going to make things right. We're going to offer a challenge. Can you make it one year without your smart technology? No phones, no laptops. And then we'll give you the scholarship of your dreams. Full ride wherever you want to go. Now, a lot of students are like, I don't know if I can do this. And a lot of ones are like, let's go retro. Let's get into it. Living like they're living in like a retro movie and, and dressing in vintage clothes and all the great music. And they're having fun. Every week there's a new challenge, but then students start disappearing and they're getting kidnapped. And it's up to our main protagonist, Luna, to figure out who's sabotaging this challenge or maybe she's next. Now expect all of like great fun vibes, expect to, to make new best friends, expect to fall in love, expect lies, secrets, betrayal, all the juicy stuff. And something that we love about this book that we're really happy and proud to present is that every single chapter title is actually um, a song. So mm -hmm. there's a QR code in the index, which makes the index a playlist. And you can go to iTunes, um, Spotify, you know, YouTube and listen while you read or just each chapter title really foreshadow what's going to happen next. And educators around the country are loving this because <clears throat> they're having their students go retro and they go retro for the day in order to be able to receive the book. And then they, afterwards they lock their phones away and then they're able to talk about all the important topics that we have in this book, like <clears throat> how we relate to social media. Uh, we talk about cyberbullying. We talk about mental health. It's really important for us to talk about because at the end of the day, you know, there's people behind every single screen and often we can forget that. Um, and we want to remind the audience and readers to be compassionate to all those people on the other side. But for us, we wanted to have fun with this. We wanted to make this fun thriller. Um, so we wanted kids to be able to, I don't know, enjoy those themes, but at the same time, just be hooked. Like they're, you know, just no. binging this book. I think what you said was totally right about uh, YA. You have hope at the end of the book. Yeah. And we wanted to show that. We wanted to have a happy ending. Uh, yeah, it's a thriller, but we wanted to leave you with a happy taste in the mouth. Uh, we're screenwriters too. So we feel like mixing generous is something way more common on TV than on books. But we were like, you know what? We are doing a thriller, but we are doing a fun one. That is something that is not that common, but we wanted to do it. And, and that's, I feel like the cover really represents that um, because you can tell there is some action and there is palms on fire, but which means there's action and something big happening, but it's fun. That's why it's really shiny. And um, a lot of teachers have been just been loving this around the country because we've been doing a lot of actual school visits. We were just mm -hmm. speaking, we do virtual visits constantly. And if anyone's interested, you, you're always welcome to email us. My email is really just my name at gmail.com. I got name, the good, last name. I got the good one. First yeah. name and last name. <laughs> uh, so, you know, we're, we're always doing these virtual visits and students are just loving it. And then also we ask questions and really engage them on social media. Um, students are always welcome and teachers and librarians just to message us on social media if they have a question or watch our videos. Um, we're always, always on there. So you're always welcome to follow us. We're at Sophie and Jared. S-O-F-I-A-N-D-J-A-R-R-O-D. Yeah. And something about this book and our brand is that we love um, diverse, a diverse cast. I'm from Spain, you can tell by my accent, and I, my first language is Spanish. So that's why in the book was really important that it was some Spanish, but we would make sure that it wasn't in italics because for me it felt like you know, Spanish is a natural language for many people. Like it doesn't have to be something weird. Um, so many homes speak Spanish of the parents or the grandparents. So our main protagonist, Luna, is a strong Hispanic female and, and we are really happy with her. And um, there is um, there's a lot of story because yeah. there are a couple. Uh, so we put a lot of ourselves there. Um, we love writing way. We are writing another way book. Um, we are entering in adult. So we're writing an adult book and a middle grade book. And they are completely different experiences. Uh, but we love them all. Um, but yeah, we're, we're really happy. This book came out one month ago. Um, and we're just really happy to talk about it with you today. And I think <laughs> that you have some questions for us. We can't yeah. wait to hear they are. <laughs> I want you to know that I actually went to Spotify and I downloaded your playlist. Yeah. Oh, nice. How did you even find, I mean, those, those, those songs are from my era. You yeah. guys were even born when some of those came out. I was listening to them the whole time. I, I mean, we loved it. It was interesting because we went on places like TikTok to see what was still trending or yeah. going on YouTube to find out what retro songs young people yeah. still love today. 
and we were able to cultivate a playlist that is able to catch all the generations. That yeah, was the and goal. Every chapter. Yeah. Yeah. Every single and chapter. I, it's really interesting because I heard somebody say that one of the things was she would go forward and look at the song for that chapter, because if the song was one that looked like it might be a problem, then she'd say, uh oh, I need to yeah. prepare myself for this chapter. Exactly. <laughs> what do the kids tell, tell us some of the things that the kids say to you about you about retro? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So you know, one of the things is like many kids with different backgrounds feel identified with one of the characters. And that was really important for us. We have completely different people. Something about the retro challenge is that we show that to get out of your comfort zone and they end making friends that otherwise would have never made. Like they talk with, with other classmates that they have never talked before. Um, they're really different. As we said, Luna uh, is Hispanic. And then we have Axel that is this kind of influencer a uh, privileged guy, and we have that net that is just fighting against the system and, and fighting the revolution and, and questioning himself. Um, by words. And, and students have been talking a lot about things like um, how they feel with technology, right? With their relationship to it. Um, I know we have some pictures, yeah, of yeah. all these different school visits we've done where teachers have been locking away the phones. Students are loving it actually because yeah. they're getting to go retro and they're doing it in a fun way. Yeah. And they're reading the book and seeing how they relate to the characters. Um, so, I mean, students have just been saying like, people are saying they're reading the book in a day. Um, and that's the best Which thing. Which is that crazy. We, for that. Best thing we can hear. Yeah. And then uh, they say a lot that they realize they were analyzing and they realized that they get less anxious when they do a retro challenge. They realize that anxiety is really related to, um, to their cell phone. And that's yeah. something that happened to our main protagonist. She has anxiety. Um, so it was really interesting to, to see that. And it's teachers have found it to just be a really great like educational tool where everyone's having fun and into it as well. Yeah. That sounds really great. Well, both of your, both books are full of really compelling characters. <laughs> I, I just, I love it because they are so colorful and they're so different and it's, it's fascinating to see them. But now Jared and Sophie, tell a little bit because um, Nat Natalie has already told us about how, why she picked that uh, defunct movie theater in the mall. And that was kind of a central focal point of your book too. Yeah. How did you happen to pick that? So um, I think when we think in the 90s or the 80s, we all think in the mall and we yeah. all see that the malls are disappearing. Um, so we have clear that, that that will show really a different in the era. Like one of the things that happened in the book is saving the mall because Luna's mom, uh, she's the owner of the theater. Of, right. of the mall. So we thought that it would be a good way to show uh, what the retro challenge can do and the power of, of that challenge. Um, we thought it was a good idea. And then something we wanted to do is like, we feel like Luna's mom is an immigrant. And we feel like sometimes immigrants get into this cliche of they almost give them like just three kind of jobs. And we were like, you know what? Our immigrant is going to be the owner of the theater. Uh, we want her to be a businesswoman. And, and we felt that totally play with Luna having the weight of the family and trying to save them all. And at the same time, the mall is disappearing. But thanks to the retro challenge, it's, it's cool again. So we felt it was a perfect way to, to show the transition. Oh, yeah. That really was. That was. <laughs> um, Elanita, do we have some more time? I'd love to have each of you tell about how you do your writing. Um, what your schedules are, how you work, and all that sort of stuff. And whichever one would like to start, go ahead and start. Oh, okay. uh, sure. So, okay. so when it comes to writing, uh, for me, I mean, I'm order guy. Like, I wake up in the morning, I have my coffee, I like the sunrise, I listen to my music, I have, like, everything ordered in my desk, and, like, I get really into it. I really love that. But, like, I'm kind of just the complete opposite of so I'm like chaos. <laughs> I love to work at night from the bed all Nothing is organized. I love my hot Cheetos at 2 a.m. Um, <laughs> we are the opposite. But then during the day we meet and then is when we work together. So he works in the mornings alone. Then I wake up around 10. We work together and then he goes to sleep and I keep working. So it's kind of like we work like 20 hours per day. Yeah, non-stop. Non Between two time zones, Between right? Time the zone. Spanish time zone, the American time zone. And, you know, whenever we write together, we're always like, we always make sure that instead of digging our heels into the sand, if one person has an idea, the other one doesn't like, it takes two yeses to, any, to make anything go forward and anyone has veto power. And then on top of that, we just, we're really different from different cultures, different genders, different religions, backgrounds, first languages. So we 
we the Venn diagram right of what makes us you know our book makes us that we both agree on is much smaller we think than a lot of other people but that we think lends to the uniqueness of what we do because I can't write our protagonist Luna without Sophie and Sophie can't write Luna without me so and what we think it we feel it makes it special yeah. it does indeed and I was I've always been fascinated about co-authoring how somebody how people can work together especially if you're in a marriage you know, yeah. I, could, I mean, my husband used to say that we couldn't even hang wallpaper together. It would be all over one or the other of us. <laughs> We've gotten really good at all the other stuff, yeah. too, because writing's built up this strength in us. I mean, at the end of the day, we know the most important thing is us yeah. before the book. And that's, that's always really important oh, because we were, sorry. That, that allows you to write a book that then actually has all that love embedded in it yeah. rather than fighting over the ego or the specific person. Yeah, and we were a screen. We were writing a screenplays before we started the book, so we already trained that communication skill before starting retro. Oh, that's good. And Natalie, what about you? How what's your day like when you write? Oh gosh, that's first of all, that's so amazing, you guys. I'm just in oh, awe that you can write. <laughs> And Jared, I'm in awe of your order. And Sophie, you and I are soul sisters because chaos <laughs> personified. I always laugh because I think people think of, Jared, they think of you. They think mm -hmm. writers are sitting at a desk. There is a cup of coffee, perhaps a view of a garden. It's very, it's very staid and organized. That is absolutely not my life at all. First, I have a full-time job and three kids. So I am always writing whenever I possibly can. So I'm writing at night. I'm writing in the morning. I'm writing on lunch breaks. I never write at a desk. That's a really unusual thing about me. I tend to write on couches standing yep. up at my kitchen counter, in bed. Like I, I never write at a desk. Wow. So that's a weird thing. And then, yeah, like I, I'm so in awe of hearing. I love hearing about other people's, the way they tackle a story, the way they go about it. For me, I would say the beginning of a story, if you're looking at that aspect, is usually like one inspiration scene. It is very cinematic for me. I see something, kind of pause, and I'm like, oh, that might be a book. And that scene begins to build on itself. So usually a story starts with a kernel, like one scene that I can very clearly visualize in my head. I can hear the characters talking. I can see everything about it. And then that's where the story is born. I go, is that enough? Is that a scene or is that a book? That's where it mm -hmm. kind of comes into question. And when did you actually decide that you were going to start making stories instead of, you know, being buried behind business documents? Oh, um, this is a little bit sad. Um, when my mom died, I was really young. I was 28 and my mom was very young. She was 51, which is certainly not when you expect to lose your parents. Right. It was brutally hard, but it was also many people that I know that have lost a parent say it is the most terrible gift you'll ever receive, but there is a gift in it. And the gift for me was an awareness of time that I don't think most people have at that age, in their 20s. I really realized that I was so busy doing all of the logical things because writing is a bit of a risk. You go out, you could sell, you could not sell, you could invest all of this, people could not like it. There's a lot of risk involved. It's scary to put your heart on a page and then say, okay, what do you think? Mm -hmm. uh, but when I saw that my mom's life was cut much shorter than she thought, I realized if I don't do this thing I've always wanted to do, and I'm always writing stories in my head. I think most writers, we are writing whether or not we're actually creating the stories or we're just quietly keeping them in our heads, yep. always writing. So I think that is that was the moment that really inspired me. Like, I have to try to do this. If I don't, there's going to come a day when I didn't do it. And now it is too late. You know, I'm going to realize there were things I wanted to do that I didn't do. So that awareness of time, it was a really hard thing, but it, it has been such a gift in that respect that I really tackled it. I went, I dove right in. Um, I wrote three books that were terrible and rejected soundly as they should have been. And then I started figuring it out. I wrote one that was pretty close uh, that I still may revisit and clean up. And then, uh, then I wrote six months later, which was my book that sold. And I've been selling since. So it's, I've been so very fortunate, but it was a lot of hard work. Yeah. I, I told uh, Elanita this yesterday. I mean, I wrote nonfiction because I was writing a children's textbook. Wow. And at the very, oh, it's the hardest work I've ever done in my life. And it was also wee into the wee hours because I was, you know, working full time then. And my family started referring to it as that D book. 
I don't know if I can say that, word on, <laughs> but think of what beavers have. It was that kind of a book. Yeah. And so, <laughs> I think we're all in that place at some point. <laughs> yeah. Oh gosh, yeah. I didn't think it would ever end. And then they asked me to do a sequel and I said, oh, or, you know, do a new edition. And I said, mm, I'm sorry, I can't, <laughs> I can't. I lived through it once. That was enough. And yeah, that fiction, of course, is a little different when you're in form information or something. Um, uh, Elanita, these were wonderful. Do we have some questions from the audience? We do not, but um, we thank you very much. And this is very enjoyable. And it's really interesting to hear your writing style because you both, uh, both groups, both teams are very different. And it goes to show you that that's what makes us what we are. And we create wonderful new stories because we do things differently. And I find it interesting also that both stories have to do with a mall. That is so <laughs> wild. I have wild, that's right? crazy. I get the chances. Yeah. I know. I think it's great. I love that. I think it's a great idea. That. Yeah. I'll be talking idea. about your book for sure. I'll be like, this is the other one. Yeah. <laughs> And the chances of the publishers not knowing who else is going to be on presenting their titles, that's yes. just pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to thank you both. This is being recorded. Thank you so much. The thank you so much. Out to all the registrants. And uh, we thank Sourcebook and Simon and & Schuster. And I thank you three and four. Susie, you're the best. Mm -hmm. Thank you.